Hi, everybody. Hey, I'm so pleased to be with you this afternoon and a chance to share a really important topic that I'm quite passionate about, this whole GLP-1 uh, extraordinary experience that we're all going through here globally. And uh, I'd love, love to know, are you all set? If you, uh, if you hear me okay, go to chat and just give me a thumbs up if you can uh, record and hear okay. And secondly, I'd love to know where you are. Uh, we've got people from all over the world that have signed up, and I'd, I'd love to get some information as to the various places that you're responding from. Oh, we got people from South Africa. We've got people from Australia. We've got people from Copenhagen. Oh, gee whiz, uh, Cincinnati, uh, Virginia. Uh, wow, what fun. Look at look at this. Well, this is the, the beauty of this media that we're working on these days, a chance to see a a global uh, a global audience sitting here in uh, Bainbridge Island, Washington, this this afternoon. So so thanks so much and a, a thumbs up to all of you. I hope I can share with you some uh, some news to use. I think I can over the course of the next hour on this uh, important topic of um, GLP one and its relationship to the future of healthcare. So thank you again for being part of the of the series and let me if I can. I'm going to share my screen and uh, and we're going to have at it here. So. Get your um, five position harness in place <laughs> and away we go. So GLP-1 in focus, bridging the gap between nature and innovation. And the reason I put nature in there is that this is a natural molecule, glucagon-like peptide one. So we want to put it in the right context as we're discussing it. Let me just say a couple of quick words before we get into the material at hand. So this turns out I just thought about this today, that this is my 50th anniversary year of being involved in the nutritional field as a, as a professional. 50 years ago, I was a, a professor of chemistry and environmental science, and uh, we published our first papers on vitamin E with my, uh, my graduate student at the time. And that kind of birthed me in this whole field. Uh, it's hard to believe a half a century has passed, but a lot of things has happened. One of the things that we know that's happened, obviously, is that we as a global community have got Matter, particularly in the Western world. Uh, obesity has become a major pandemic of its own. And it begs the question, why? And we often think, well, it's because we eat a lot more food, we have ultra-processed diets, and all of that then creates this obesity epidemic. And it is true that certainly the composition and the quantity of our diet, the calories that we're consuming, does contribute to this obesity problem. However, and this is an important fact, the increase in the average weight in our population per person does not track with the increase in calories. In fact, the weight has gone up faster than the calories. So what's going on? There's got to be something beyond calories. And that's going to be really the focus of this discussion. I've been speaking for now over 30 years about food as information. It's not just calories. It's not just vitamins and minerals. It brings information from which our genes then express themselves into what becomes our phenotype, how we look, act, and feel. And therefore, if we really want to understand the obesity epidemic, we have to understand more than just calories. We have to understand the composition of calories as it relates to the information those calories are bringing to our body and how that as a signal or signals is translated into our function and how we look, act, and feel. And our body composition is part of that. So I want to emphasize that this story about GLP-1 is a very symbolic and in, enigmatic uh, way of thinking about food as information, because this family of introendocrine hormones is a response to information that our body is getting from our diet. Okay, with that in mind, let's move ahead and see what we can we can find about the uh, the connection. So for me, you probably know I've been around in this, as I said, for a half a century, hard to believe. Um, this information I'm presenting is in part related to my five decades of experience, but also related to my more recent experience as a founder and president of Big Bold Health, which I'm very proud to be part of this, um, this organization that's really focused on personal immune health. And um, we've made, I think, some really significant progress the last few years in starting to interrogate and decipher uh, the signals of the immune system and how we optimize its function. So it's with that uh, that I continue on the program. So let's talk about GLP-1 agonists, a new recipe for success. And that's the title of this JAMA 
uh, March 26, uh, 2024 article. The author of this uh, article is the um, a celebrity, um, well-known um, opinion leader in the field, Dr. Darius Musafarian, who is uh, in charge of the Food as Medicine program at Tufts University in, in Boston. Um, and he was uh, discussing this new recipe for success. And I think that the uh, little uh, breakout that I chose from the article is uh, sim symbolic of uh, what we're learning about GLP-1-based drugs. He says, yet clinical and public confusion exist around worldwide uh, costs and tolerability and access to the drugs. One half of U.S. adults are interested in taking a prescription weight loss drug. That's one half, 50% of the population. And 93 million people meet the GLP-1 weight loss criteria eligible to take that drug, the GLP-1 agonist drug. U.S. list prices presently for these drugs is between $12,000 and $16,000 per year. Even with maximum negotiated discounts, costs will widely come down to no, uh, no less than $6,500 per year. So if all the people that were eligible that are interested in taking this weight loss family of drugs were to receive a GLP-1 agonist at discounts, the annual cost would be $600 billion in the United States alone, equal to all other U.S. prescription drug spending combined. Wow. <laughs> okay. So what is he suggesting? What is he suggesting is this can't be the long-term solution to the problem. There's got to be some other way of getting to the answer to our obesity epidemic and its connection to a variety of chronic age-related diseases that are associated with excess body weight. And so he's suggesting this uh, combined stage GLP-1, um, what, what, what I guess you would call food as medicine approach, uh, in which uh, the healthcare practitioner, uh, allied health sciences, dietitians, health coaches, and so forth, were involved in delivering a recipe to support a patient's long-term weight management to get them off of the GLP-1 agonist drugs after maybe using them for a short period of time as a booster rocket. Now, the reason I bring that up is that um, recently, uh, Mark Wolf Schneider, uh, the previous uh, CEO of arguably one of the largest food companies in the world, and that is Nestle, uh, made a statement to the public and his board that he is not worried about these GLP-1 agonist uh, drugs as a, as a uh, food company because we should be designing foods that are supportive of GLP-1 and helping then for people to have success by utilizing available science to con, uh, construct the composition of foods that would ultimately lead to proper weight management by regulation of GLP-1 and other the intraendocrine hormones. And I think that's a very thoughtful and visionary approach that, that really syncs up with what Dr. Musafarian is talking about in this uh, recent JAMA paper about this combined stage GLP-1 um, uh, food as medicine approach. So with that, let's go on to ask, what do we know about GLP-1? Well, we started to recognize that this, um, this hormone that is produced by the body has many, many benefits. It's not just solely on reducing appetite or solely on brown fat uh, activation, mitochondrial uh, influences, but it influences across the range of uh, many, many organs positive uh, health benefits. And in fact, this um, uh, recent paper in Maturitis uh, talks about the uh, uh, GLP-1 agonist drugs as a key to turn back the aging clock, biological age. And it uh, helps in things like neurodegenerative disorders. It helps in cardiovascular disease. It helps in type 2 diabetes. It helps in um, areas of uh, cancer prevention. So there may be many, many beneficial effects uh, for GLP-1 agonists beyond that, just solely uh, for weight uh, weight control. And if we look at the multiple clinical benefits, this was discussed in a recent issue of Science Magazine in the July 19th issue of 2024, we can see that there are many uh, powerful effects of uh, GLP-1 agonists that tie themselves together with reduction in whole body inflammation. And I think that's an interesting process, uh, this chronic, what's called sometimes inflammaging. Uh, that's associated with the uh, relative risk to many different order disorders, myocardial infarction, atherosclerosis, um, chronic kidney disease, kidney failure, uh, metabolic uh, liver disorders related to MASH, 
and uh, and neurodegenerative disorders um, associated with um, uh, early stage dementia. So these uh, these GLP-1 agonists have a wide range of potential, but I want to emphasize this hormone is produced naturally and it's been with us for some period of time. And so you might ask the question, you know, why do we suddenly have uh, all these obesity-related problems that are associated with all these age-related disorders, uh, which didn't plague the human population until recently. Well, part of it is maybe because we're living longer, but also we're living longer, less healthily, because of the signals that have changed these neuroendocrine and uh, neuro uh, intraendocrine hormone uh, activities. And it's those that we'll be talking about. The signals, I said, uh, food is information that play a role in this whole uh, pandemic that we're starting to see as it relates to uh, these conditions. So glucagon-like peptide one, what does this name mean? Let, let's take it apart just for a second. So glucagon, what is glucagon? Glucagon is the counter-regulatory hormone produced by the endocrine pancreas to that of insulin. We all know about insulin and its ability to stimulate uh, glucose um, transport across uh, cell membranes. And we also know that uh, the balancing effect for um, insulin so that you don't end up with uh, lowering your blood sugar too much is glucagon. So they have this counter balancing uh, crosstalk between uh, glucagon and insulin. Now, both glucagon and insulin are, are hormones made up of amino acids because they're peptide uh, um, protein hormones. And so peptides are small um, strings of amino acids that have specific activities. And so specific activity in this case with glucagon-like peptide one is that this hormone that's produced by the body uh, is a small uh, kind of a uh, cognate or a similar uh, signaling kind of substance to that of glucagon, but it regulates different functions and it is produced then in response to um, when and how and what we eat. So glucagon like peptide one, natural hormone has to do with this whole insulin signaling glucoregulatory um, capacity. So if we look at glucagon like peptide one, we find out it's built out of a variety of amino acids that are unique to its composition. It is stored in cells that happen to be in the intestinal mucosa waiting to be released into the blood when it is signaled to do so from the signals that come from our diet. And so our foods and specific constituents within our foods then are capable of stimulating the release from the uh, specific cell types in the, in the uh, intestinal mucosa into the blood of this, um, this hormone, uh, which is called an introendocrine hormone, intero, E-N-T-E-R-O, um, meaning it's produced inside the uh, endocrine system of the intestinal tract, which is something probably new to many of you that these drugs or these uh, hormones can be produced in that capacity. So here's a summary uh, as to what we were saying. GLP-1 is a hormone that plays a crucial role in managing blood sugar, and it has an effect across many different organs. Several organs play a role in the synthesis, but one that is most important is the small intestine. And there are cells within the distal region of the ileum that are called L cells that are specific to the release of GLP-1 when the information from the diet, specific information, triggers the release. You also find GLP-1 being released from the, pan the, uh, the, um, the endocrine pancreas, from the liver, uh, from the brain and the stomach. So there are many different sites of release, but the most important one in terms of magnitude comes from the GI mucosa, the L cells. So it's a member of a family of hormones. It's not working all by itself. It uh, is a part of the what I call the intraendocrine hormone family, which, by the way, um, we've known about for some time, but only kind of recently has it received the this family of hormones, the attention that it deserves. So GLP-1, gastrointestinal intestinal peptide, or GIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, VAP, cholecystokinin CCK, PYY, ghrelin, these are all examples of intraendocrine hormones that are produced by specific cells within the gastrointestinal tract in response to the information from our diet that then regulates our function postprandially, meaning after eating. 
So what is an agonist? Because we, uh, we say these drugs are GLP-1 agonists. An agonist is a substance that stimulates the release or activity of that particular substance. So in this case, it's an agonist drug is stimulating the release and activity of that specific intraendocrine hormone, GLP-1. And the drug names that you're familiar with that are in this class include Ozempic, Wagovi, Trulicity, Victoza, um, Ribelsis, and, and more recently, Munjaro. Munjaro is interesting because it's a dual intraendocrine hormone stimulant. It's called a tears of peptide. So it's a dual uh, GLP-1 and GIP uh, uh, stimulator. And it has also been associated uh, with weight loss and uh, effects on body composition. So this can transform obesity uh, by these uh, multi-receptor drugs, because you can imagine, well, if one receptor active activity is good, what about two, three, or four? So you're going to see drugs that are being produced and released into our marketplace that will add together many different endocrine, uh, horm uh, intraendocrine hormone stimulants. And so you know, the tears of peptide that I just mentioned with Monjaro has just got two, but one can uh, consider that there are drugs in, a, in a kind of work right now that have three stimulants of these intraendocrine hormones. So this uh, is going to be a horsepower uh, race here to see who can get the biggest part of market share in the most activity of, of these, these compounds. So uh, we know the names like semiglutide, I talked about sera, uh, tears, tears of peptide. So these are one receptor agonist, GLP-1 with Ozempic and Magovi, two receptor agonists with Munjaro and Zephound. And now there's a new drug that's uh, being uh, explored that has three. So just keep your, <laughs> keep your eyes on the news because we're going to see more and more drug intervention into this family of intraendocrine hormones. Now, where did they come from? It's a very interesting history. And those of you not familiar with how this was discovered, let me just quickly review. And there's a lot more to this story than we have time to, to go through, but um, I'll, I'll give you some top line. So in uh, the early uh, 1930s, um, a Belgian researcher, uh, Jean Le Biard, uh, Barre, identified that there was a hormone in the gastrointestinal tract that was responsible for stimulating insulin secretion. And he called this an incretin. That's the English translation. Uh, and it was a blending of ingestion and secretion, this incretin. In the 1960s, then, researchers showed the incretin effect was responsible for about two-thirds of people's insulin response. And so this would be like an insulin booster or an insulin um, activity uh, sensitizer. And one of those uh, was found out to be a GIP, uh, glucose-dependent insulotrophic polypeptide, and then later, uh, another member of that family, the so-called intraendocrine hormone family, was found to be glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1. Now, this it turns out that if you start to say, okay, now we have a mechanism of action, but um, how can the drug world take advantage of these discoveries? Well, believe it or not, we go to the Gila monster. <laughs> because it turns out that the Gila monster in their saliva uh, was found to be a inhibitor of uh, the enzyme that breaks down uh, GLP-1 in the blood. That enzyme is called DPP-4, the dipeptidylpeptidase 4. Um, and this uh, agent that was found in Gila monster saliva could then uh, block the breakdown of GLP-1 when it goes in the blood and extend its lifetime and that became then the basis of the first drug that was focused on the intraendocrine hormones, this uh, incretin effect using the uh, DPP4 uh, inhibitor. Now we recognize that the intestinal cells make these GLP1 agonists, and they rapidly, when put into the blood, uh, are broken down by the DPP4. And so the body has a natural process um, upon the information that comes from certain foods, it stimulates the release of these hormones into the blood, but it doesn't stick around for a long time, only a few, uh, less than an hour. And then the uh, the enzyme DPP4 breaks it down. Now that begs the question, why would that happen? Why would it uh, produce it and then break it down? And there's regulatory effects for that because you do not want that hormone sticking around indefinitely 
because it could have um, untoward effects in terms of the resiliency and network biology associated with the, the regulation of glucose and the other uh, functions that occur from the enteroendocrine uh, compounds. Now let's go to the GLP-1 agonist drugs. What do they do? They produce supra-physiological levels of these hormones in the blood, and they're designed to stick around for a long time. They don't just go away in a few minutes. They stick around. Now, do we know what that impact is over the long term? Not yet. We're doing this study right now in the human volunteers that are taking these drugs for a long period of time, what that effect might be. We don't really know the answer to that question yet because it's not the natural way that the GLP-1 uh, it works in the body, which is uh, produced after meals and then broken down rather rapidly. So there are multiple organs then, as I said, that have functions associated uh, with the GLP-1. And you know we talked about the brain and obviously the stomach, the endocrine pancreas. Uh, it has effects on muscle physiology, on adipose tissue. The uh, adipocyte uh, is also influenced by uh, the, the intraendocrine hormones. Uh, liver, uh, so-called MASH, the metabolic-associated steatosis and um, cardiovascular uh, function. Uh, all of these uh, have signals from these enteroendocrine hormones that are uh, influencing in the function of these organs. And so we would consider the clinical effects that uh, have been seen from that include body weight, blood pressure, plasma glucose, plasma lipids, all of those, uh, as well as um, electrolyte uh, exchange of the nephron in the kidney, uh, sodium excretion. Uh, all of these are related then to the activity of GLP-1. This is kind of a partial list. Uh, so it lowers inflammatory potential in the adipocyte. It lowers liver fat. It has uh, an improvement on insulin signaling by re reducing insulin resistance. It lowers appetite and increases satiety. It has a positive effect on endothelial nitric oxide synthase, so it improves contractibility of the, um, of the blood vessels to regulate blood pressure. A lot of good things here that are associated with the regulation of these enteroendocrine hormones. Now, what are the problems that one might then suggest uh, could come from long-term use of GLP-1 agonist drugs? Interesting question. Well, first of all, we already talked about the expense. They um, are not cheap, and they're not reimbursed at, at present. Uh, they do have a side effect uh, that is seen in about a quarter of the, of the people that take them, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They can lead to hypoglycemia, especially if they're combined with other drugs that lower blood sugar, so that has to be concerning. Uh, there is a small percentage of people that have taken these drugs that end up with pancreatitis, bowel obstruction, gastroparesis, and other kinds of uh, gastrointestinal complaints. It's not common, but it has uh, occurred. And, and as more people take these drugs, obviously you're gonna get more people that have these complaints. And then maybe most interestingly for us is something a lot of people have thought have not thought about, but um, uh, Dr. Um, Mark Ulf Schneider uh, was, was talking about when he talked about Nestle's response to this, and that is the creation of dietary insufficiencies. Now, what do we, why would we create dietary insufficiencies? Because if you create then a um, appetite suppressing effect, so you're eating less calories, you're also eating less calories from the foods that you were eating, which were probably marginally nutrient adequate to begin with, maybe even not adequate. And now you've made that problem even worse. So now you've exacerbated the potential for nutrient insufficiencies and uh, the problems of metabolically that occur downstream from that. And so now you get into the potential for metabolic dysfunction. So that means we need high density, nutrient density foods um, in order to go along with the GLP agonists so that we don't end up inducing nutritional insufficiencies in individuals. We'll come back uh, to talk about that more, but I think it is an important part of the story that's emerging around these uh, GLP agonist drugs. Now, how does GLP-1 connect to me the metabolism of sugar? Well, this mechanism is, uh, is is being explored extensively because of the uh, the use of these medications. So I'm just giving you a little cartoon here that kind of summarizes a part of what we've learned about how GLP-1 connects to the metabolism sugar. So you know that the blood sugar is transported uh, across the um, cellular membrane uh, by a glucose uh, transporter, GLUT4, uh, and that that then transports uh, glucose ultimately into 
uh, the mitochondria where it can be broken down into um, into energy through the glycolytic pathway. GLP-1 then stimulates through its receptor a whole signaling process that travels through the uh, mammalian target of uh, rapamycin or mTOR, and you've you've heard about a lot of mTOR and um, the hy hypoxic induced factor to alpha. These are associated uh, with um, longevity. Uh, they're associated with positive influences on uh, cellular metabolism. And so we get this complex uh, signaling effect that occurs as a consequence of um, improving glucose uh, metabolism, improved um, mTOR and, and uh, AMPK kinase, uh, adenosine monophosphate kinase activity, and how that influences then the, uh, the proper regulation of insulin and, and cellular metabolism. And as I mentioned, that connects then to the metabolism in many organs. Uh, and one of those tissues that is really important in this story is the immune system, because the immune system is a sugar-hungry <laughs> cell type. It uh, it needs a lot of energy in order to do its function, just like the um, um, uh, in the, in the nervous system, the um, uh, the brain requires a lot of energy uh, through proper glucose management. And so the immune system is really dependent also on the activity of GLP-1 and how that translates its message out through many different immune cell types and ultimately influences uh, this process of cellular balance in many organs. So I think, again, we tie immune system function to GLP-1 signaling. And again, I want to go back to say, historically, the way this worked was by eating the right foods with the right dietary information that created the proper regulation of these enteroendocrine hormones. Now, what about diet? It's a relationship to GLP-1 and this problem of DPP-4. Well, we know that uh, when eating a, uh, a diet that's really supportive of proper enteroendocrine function, meaning the signals or the messages from that diet, remember food is information, to keep coming back to that concept, that the, uh, uh, the, the digestive um, system, the, uh, the enzymes that are present, will ultimately stimulate the, um, the release from the receptors on the uh, small intestine, uh, the so-called L-cell receptors, that will release uh, GLP-1. That will go out into the blood, and it will have its activity uh, in improving all those functions that I just mentioned, but will then have a only a certain length of time that that message is retained in the blood, and then it is broken down by the enzyme DPP-4. So these are... These, this relationship is a very important relationship that is a natural part of the process of, of regulating these functions over time. An imbalanced diet, which we have as a culture been consuming for some time, we all know that. Some people call that the standard American diet or the SAD diet or SAD diet. It has a significant connection to this imbalance then of the intraendocrine hormone signaling, particularly GLP-1 signaling. And so it also induces another thing, and that is that that uh, altered diet, that ultra-processed diet, that um, uh, SAD diet, also induces alterations in our gut microbiome. And alterations in the gut microbiome have been found to produce dysbiosis. Dysbiosis then does what? It sends different signals to the receptor sites on our GI mucosa that regulate GLP-1 secretion. So dysbiosis then induces alterations in GLP-1 secretion. So you'll notice we're getting multiple mechanisms by which we have produced by the way we eat and the way we live and the toxins we're exposed to on the alteration of intraendocrine hormone regulation of blood sugar and the relationship that has to our immune system. All of those things then have downstream adverse effects. So if we want to talk about upstream or root cause, we've got to go up to the signals that the diet then sends downstream that regulates these processes, such as um, the incretin in uh, um, uh, mechanisms associated with GLP-1. This also connects to the, the nervous system through the, the vagus nerve, this, this long, you know, winding pathway from the central nervous system, a cranial nerve that innervates the GI tract and goes down through the length of our body and sends signals out back to the brain, so both efferent and afferent, and that we now know that the GLP-1 and its relationship with uh, 
with the diet that we're eating, the messages we're getting the diet influences a vagal nerve signaling and has an effect on the, um, the hypothalamus of the brain. So in part, this also talks about regulation of appetite because we know the appetite control center resides in the brain. So we, uh, we, we, break, we see this mechanism of this crosstalk, this network among the immune system, gut microbiome, nervous system, and the intraendocrine system all communicating together. They magically and beautifully do that when they're given the right information from the appropriate information that comes from our diet. The problem is we haven't been getting the right information from our diet. We've been getting disinformation from the diet, produces disharmony well relative to this process, and produces dis ease in the person who is consuming that diet for a long period of time. So GLP-1 and other intracrine endocrine hormones, which are released by the intestinal mucosal cells, are an important part of this story. So if we really look at these hormones, again, there are many uh, in this family. And I, I want to, again, just remind you that this is a family. It's not just GLP-1 by itself. So we have uh, serotonin, uh, over half of the body serotonin, is produced almost two-thirds, actually, in the GI mucosa. Gastrin, secretin, introglucagon, and we already talked about VIP, cholecystokinin, CCK, uh, motilin, uh, somatostatin, uh, GLP-1. All of these are uh, gut hormones as part of the endocrine system. And here is the aha. It turns out that the hormones that we're talking about are released into the blood after eating as a consequence of activities that have come through receptors on the GI mucosa that have the same functional construction as do the bitter taste receptors on our tongue, meaning our digestive system is tasting food and it's tasting bitter. Bitter receptors in the gut mucosa control the release of glucagon-like peptide 1. Is that an aha or what? As we've cut bitter out of our diet, we have cut then down the level of intraendocrine GLP-1 that's produced. Now, where does bitter come from? Bitter basically comes from vegetables. So as we've removed vegetables from our diet, which is standard operating procedure, we have lowered the signals that come from the diet information that then triggers the release of these introendocrine hormones. So if we look at the five main tastes, salty, sour, umami, bitter, sweet, we know that you get different introendocrine hormone reactions from each of these uh, particular sensations of these foods, and that the receptors, um, the, the TAS1, which are sweet receptors or the TAS2, which are bitter receptors, have different uh, constituents in different foods that activate the release of these endocrine uh, hormones mm -hmm. into the blood. So if we then look at the uh, particular site of these receptors along our digestive tract, uh, this is kind of a, a diagram that shows where the fat receptors are, where the umami and protein receptors are, where the bitter taste receptors are, and where the sweet and carbohydrate receptors are. And you'll note that um, the bitter receptors uh, reside principally in the small intestine. Uh, and so we then get the release of the intraendocrine hormones from activation of these bitter receptors. And does that mean that every bitter substance activates the same bitter receptors? Well, no, there are 35 different mammalian bitter taste receptors. Some are more active in releasing uh, glucagon-like peptide 1 than others. And within foods, not all bitterness induces glucagon-like peptide 1. So certain foods are much more capable of activating these receptors than others. So it's eating the right foods, sending the right information to our digestive system that then activates and regulates the release of these enteroendocrine hormones. So there's a direct connection between this bitter receptors that sit on the tip of our tongue and those receptors that sit on the GI mucosa, particularly in this case, on the L cells of the distal ileum and how that then secretes upon stimulation 
of the right bitter agent, uh, that would be a chemical communication, something in the food is a substance that binds to that receptor on the bitter taste receptor on a gut mucosa, sets through the cell a signaling process that then ultimately causes the release into the blood of uh, GLP-1. Again, this is the classic example of food as information. So let's look at some examples here. We know that uh, various um, uh, toxins, alkaloids, drugs, um, and uh, bitter agents in foods all influence then through this mechanism, the release of these intraendocrine cell activated uh, taste receptors, uh, releasing then a whole series of different things depending upon the bitter agent and the bitter receptor that it activates. Remember I said there are 35 different bitter receptors uh, that have been found in human physiology. And so you get different effects on regulating ultimately these intraendocrine hormone orchestrated processes, this network biology that speaks across the body to all these organs and tissues that I've been describing previously. This is a really fascinating, uh, advancing in our knowledge of the role that diet plays in how it regulates all these functions across these many organs based upon the foods we eat and the specific families of foods and within those foods, specific molecules that participate in these processes. So let's just review the different types of cells in the gastrointestinal tract and the release of different endocrine hormones, the introendocrine hormones. So you have the A cells uh, in the stomach with ghrelin and, and uh, nefsatin. You have the D cells found in the stomach and intestine with somatostatin. You have the uh, uh, 5-hydroxytryptamine with the intrachromaffin cells and serotonin, and that's where it's principally produced. Uh, go down to L cells, if you would. Look at L cells in the terminal uh, ileum, colon, and rectum. You've got GLP-1, GLP-2, PYY, oxonomodulin. Um, so all of these are specific places within our digestive system in which there is an activity that releases specific intraendocrine hormones that regulate specific function in the body that is activated by specific principles within our foods, specific foods, the specific principles within those foods. Wow, this is pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? Because it teaches us a little bit about what we should be including in our diet. It also tells us, to some extent, why we've had such obesity problems as we've cut out a lot of these signals out of our food by ultra-processing, and uh, those signals are not there to regulate these processes any longer. So the intestinal microbiome, as I also mentioned, uh, plays an important part because it's producing its own secondary metabolites from the um, the various microbes that live in our intestinal tract. They're eating and they're producing their waste products and they're dying and their cell walls are being released, all of which then can influence in these receptors of the various parts of the intraendocrine system. And so dysbiosis has been associated with alterations of intraendocrine hormone release and then alteration in blood sugar alteration in the immune system. So this all ties back again to our bitter taste receptor story that we've been advancing. And so we know there are certain food principles, again, that help in establishing the proper integrity of our microbiome. So we talk about uh, prebiotics as being uh, specific types of non-digestible carbohydrate or other the members of the um, uh, flavonoid family that stimulate uh, specific types of bacteria to flourish in the gut, friendly bacteria, symbiotic bacteria, which then helps in the agonism of GLP-1 and the other endocrine, intraendocrine hormones. And so this is like, you would say, a natural GLP-1 agonist when we have an appropriate microbiome as a consequence of feeding the microbiome the food it needs for the symbiotic friendly bacteria to produce the right signals that stimulate the, uh, the right receptors, in this case, the bitter receptors, to release um, GLP-1 and other intraendocrine hormones. So bitter foods have surprising health benefits. That's what we're learning. So we have to learn how to eat bitter. <laughs> you know, it's interesting to note that the major source of bitter presently in uh, the standard American dietary intake is coffee. Uh, coffee does stimulate, actually, some of these bitter taste receptors. So that is one contribution. Uh, tea is also uh, does that. These are your major things that the standard American 
uh, gets their bitter receptor stimulated by. But there are many, many other foods that we're not eating in our diet that are even better for uh, regulating the intraendocrine hormone release. And so, you know, you might look at uh, uh, grapefruit, um, uh, radicchio, uh, artichoke, dill, uh, lemons, uh, rocket, or uh, as you know, one of the kind of bitter tasting uh, uh, lettuce alternatives, uh, radish, uh, ginger, olives, all of these are known to contain specific substances that are bitter that activate favorably uh, these intraendocrine hormones. Wow, isn't that fascinating? Dill seed, celery seed, gold, uh, golden cress, uh, black tea. Um, I, I think this is really a fascinating chapter in how we design diets to help support proper GLP-1 release. And so bitter taste receptors are a key target to understanding the effects of how nutrients play roles and the family of nutrients in the, that relate to the bittering activities that activate the release of GLP-1 have been found within the polyphenol family, the flavonoid family, that then affect uh, blood sugar levels, affect body weight, homeostasis, and have these very important roles to play in the regulation of ghrelin, GLP-1, cholecystokinin, through these receptors that I've been mentioning. Wow, isn't that powerful? So think of flavonoid polyphenol rich foods the the more the better maybe if they're attached to them if they're attaching to the right receptors well one of those foods that we've been studying extensively uh, which happens to have a very very high level of these uh, polyphenols and flavonoids that are associated with activity of GLP1 agonist as a GLP1 agonist is the 4000 year old food Himalayan tartary buckwheat and i i happened onto this and recognized it in the american diet we kind of lost this food uh, over 200 years ago. It wasn't even available in the United States. So we're back to growing it again. And we recognize the history of this is quite powerful. It's associated with the longevity, kind of a blue zone food. High levels of immune active polyphenols. It's gluten-free. It's not a grain, but a fruit seed. It's very high in unique um, prebiotics um, that are very useful for uh, supporting proper microbiome integrity. It is known to stimulate GLP-1. It has favorable effects on blood sugar. There are over 100 phytochemicals that operate synergistically, and it's known to activate the uh, GLP-1 receptor in the small intestine. And it is a member of the bitter family of high-protein vegetables. So it, this is one of those kind of superfoods that fits into this category of contributions to improving uh, GLP-1 uh, influence. We uh, we know that um, dietary supplementation with um, Himalayan tartary uh, buckwheat uh, polyphenols uh, has been proven to, to increase endogenous glucagon-like peptide one release, and it facilitates glycemic control. It has a favorable effect on immune system function, and so we're starting to recognize uh, when you start studying these things in detail. This is kind of food chemistry applied to food as medicine that uh, there is something we can learn about the history that's back to the future, that these foods really participate in the regulation of the natural processes of weight control, sending the right message from our food to regulate the intraendocrine system. So we know that there are other foods that do this, uh, memortica uh, or wild uh, gourd, bitter gourd, uh, bitter melon as it's sometimes called, also is a GLP-1 agonist, and it probably accounts for why it has been historically known to be a, uh, a food that is associated with proper blood sugar control and insulin regulation. Um, we know that uh, cacao, which is a polyphenol-rich uh, uh, chocolate ingredient, uh, is known to have a GLP-1 agonist effect and influence postprandial glycemia, insulin, and incretin secretion in healthy participants. So this is another member of this family of Food is information that signals through the intraendocrine system. Uh, we know that uh, hops, um, you know, those of you that love hoppy beers, uh, it also has uh, a positive effect on the GLP-1 secretion and uh, maintenance of healthy weight. This is a, a randomized uh, controlled crossover trial looking at a concentrate of um, the hops-derived um, uh, flavonoids that influence in uh, these processes. And we now know that uh, even... Uh, the organs of the body, like the reproductive organs, are speaking through the bitter receptors. 
This is a study that we were involved with a number of years ago, looking at uh, PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, showing that the ovaries actually have bitter receptors that stimulated release then uh, uh, intraendocrine uh, functions that regulate hormone, androgen, estrogen balance, and uh, can help in uh, promoting proper balance, um, at least in this animal model of uh, PCOS. So you notice this story cuts across so many different clinical conditions. And when we've eaten the wrong things that are devoid of the right messenger molecules, and the message that we're getting is one of inflammation and, and alarm, not the inflammation of, uh, of regulation, then we start getting these um, downstream effects that we see as the pandemic of obesity in our culture. So we recognize that these bitter receptors are really important uh, for uh, the function of many, many cell types. This is another recent paper showing that they influence the function of uh, one of the types of uh, cells in the, in the ovaries, the granulosa cells, um, kind of confirming what we uh, published from our research uh, a few years ago. So you know, many organs are tasting, <laughs> if I can put that in air quotes. Um, and the information that provided by uh, these bitter foods that are the specific polyphenols uh, that we now know activate these receptors produce regulatory effects um, that uh, cut across all organs. Well, how about the Mediterranean diet then? Well, the Mediterranean diet is a good exemplar of a diet that activates GLP-1 and has a, uh, a bitter taste uh, component to it because of the nature of the foods that are within the, the Mediterranean diet. Uh, this is a recent paper looking at the Mediterranean diet, increasing glucagon-like peptide and oxanomodulin uh, compared with a, a normal vegetarian diet in, in patients who have blood sugar uh, insulin resistance. And this is a, a randomized controlled crossover trial in which they showed that the people that ate the Mediterranean diet with virgin olive oil and, and more uh, vegetables, and particularly the bitter family, that they were capable of having enhanced uh, regulation, glucoregulation, insulin sensitivity, and, and body weight control than uh, people just on a kind of a garden variety, I use that euphemistically, uh, vegetarian diet. So activation of bitter receptors uh, by uh, olive oil phenolics is part of the benefit because these olive oil bittering agents uh, in virgin olive oil um, activate GLP-1 receptors. And through this various TAS receptor family, the TAS2R8, uh, um, which is one of the 35 different beta re bitter receptors that activates then the release of these enteroendocrine hormones. Can you see what I've been saying here in terms of food as information? I hope so. This keeps coming back, coming back to reinforce the story that We've been eating disinformation in our diet. It's been devoid of this information we need to regulate this class of intraendocrine regulating hormones that help insulin, help control immune function, help multiple organ activities as a part of then seeing the pandemic of obesity develop. All of this is part of a new ahaism that we're developing mechanistically from this research. So what's the effect of a short-term Mediterranean um, intervention in neurodegenerative disease? So this is an interesting, uh, again, example of this uh, Mediterranean in impact on hunger um, hormones, uh, this whole family of uh, intraendocrine hormones showing that uh, hunger and metabolism and the immune system are all positively influenced and therefore it influences brain function, brain activity in middle-aged, overweight, and obese women. So it really starts talking about, wow, even way up there in the brain, well, way away from the GI tract, we're starting to see the signaling effects from eating the right information and its downstream effects to these intraendocrine hormones. So bitter is better, says this article. Wild greens are used in the blue zone. Remember the Icaria, Greece, longevity population, 100-year-old individuals, very common, not taking medications, being out of doors, uh, being active. And part of the components of that blue zone is that, in fact, these people are eating these high flavonoid diets that are rich in these agonists of natural production of the intraendocrine hormones. It is a component of every one of the blue zone diets, even 
in Loma Linda, California, one of the blue zones. If you would uh, look at the dietary survey data from people who live in Loma Linda County or the area of Loma Linda in, in, in LA County, you'll find that they are consuming diets that are very much higher in these uh, polyphenols and flavonoids than are individuals who live in LA County out of Loma Linda. Now, why is Loma Linda so unique? Because it's a Seventh-day Adventist community. A lot more emphasis on vegetarian diets, a lot more fruits and vegetable intake, a lot more whole grain intake. So we're really dealing here with signaling, eating the right information. It's a classic example of a city that sits right in the middle of LA, drinking the same water, breathing the same air, but having a very different longevity profile and profile of chronic uh, uh, illnesses as a consequence of getting the right signals from their diet that regulate their function. By the way, also lowered incidence of obesity. It's not because they're all dieting. It's because they're eating the foods that signal properly to regulate body composition. I want to emphasize that again. It's not dieting. It's eating the right foods to send the right signals for regulation of those things that control or deficit function, fat storage, and metabolism. It's not just eating too many calories. That's what I've been talking about. So if we look at genetic poly polymorphisms at the bitter taste receptor, we find that those individuals who are bitter taste receptors, we call these uh, individuals that have um, super tasters for bitter, that they're individuals that uh, have different relationships to the amount of um, bitter they consume in their diet. And it influences then downstream the signaling that influences ultimately the intro-endocrine hormone release. So there are differences among us based upon our genetic polymorphisms of the bitter taste receptors that modulates then our appetite um, habits, our taste habits, and ultimately how our diet is composed and how it influences our intro-endocrine hormone levels. So healthy diets and lifestyles in the world, the Mediterranean and blue zone people live longer, yes. And there's special emphasis in on the diet connected to the gut microbiome, connected to the intro-endocrine system. This is an emerging mechanistic explanation for how this blue zone connection to longevity emerges. And by the way, it's interesting to note, the two oldest foods in the world, both over 4,000 years old, are millet in the Indian continent and tartary buckwheat in the Asian uh, China continent. They are associated with these favorable effects that we see that regulate weight, regulate body signaling, regulate energy economy, regulate uh, immune system function. Uh, we are relearning back to the future what people have known <laughs> for 4,000 years as it relates to the, um, the benefits of, the, of these foods. So let me just close by have, giving you some questions to consider. Obviously, these are questions that kind of arise out of the concepts that I've shared with you over this last hour. So number one, why does the body produce GLP-1 and other enteroendocrine hormones? And why are they naturally degraded by enzymes such as DBP-4? And the answer is that's all part of the regulatory network, the symphony of our metabolism that has been evolved or the largest study ever done called natural selection over millions of years to give us the proper relationship with our food so that we, we regulate naturally our body weight, our body metabolism, our body energy, all those things occur by sending the right signals. I hope that concept is properly articulated by me that you can understand. It's important. Number two, what are the potential effects of overriding then the regulatory control of the intro-endocrine hormones by taking these GLP-1 agonist drugs that result in supra-physiological exposures over a long duration in the body's uh, bloodstream? I would say right now we don't know the answer to that question. We don't know because we're the first group of people now that have had ability to take these drugs for a long period of time. And you probably know if we look at Ozempic versus the drug Wagovi, it's interesting, isn't it? It's the same drug as semiglutide in both those medications. What's the difference? 
The difference is that Ozemic, which was approved for diabetes, is the same drug molecule, semaglutide, that's in the drug Wagovi that's, that's approved for obesity. The difference is that the dose in Wagovi for obesity is twice the dose that is in Ozemic for diabetes. <laughs> so uh, we're pushing even harder on these regulatory pathways or networks when we start sending higher and higher degrees of signals through these drugs to this system that's evolved naturally to regulate itself. And I don't think we know what the long-term implications of this pharmacological override is. Stay tuned, we're gonna learn. Number three, why should we eat in order to promote natural regulation of the intraendocrine hormones and regulate weight and blood sugar? Well, that's a pretty duh question, right? The answer is that's what natural physiology is built around. That's our system that we have evolved over millennia that we have in our inherent in our genes that gives response to our diets in certain ways, how that information is processed. And therefore, rather than just control calories and be in weight loss diets, maybe we should be eating the right information, foods like uh, tartary buckwheat and, and, and foods that regulate then these processes naturally that actually induce these favorable outcomes. Next, what have we learned about the role of specific bitter taste receptors and their bitter phytochemicals in plant foods in the regulation of GLP-1? This is a huge new advancing understanding of the role of certain members of the polyphenol flavonoid family and how they connect into the agonism of bitter receptors that then regulate the release of the enteroendocrine hormones that then have these multiple organ effects across the body. This is new stuff. We're, we're seeing this information become available, and now we're seeing it become available associated with longevity that actually people who eat these kinds of diets and get these signals and they're in regulation are attributes that are associated with long and healthy life, longevity. This may be part of the longevity secret that we uh, have only started to learn or relearn. Uh, the blue zones maybe were an observation of that, but now we're mechanistically starting to understand that. So stay, stay tuned as we're seeing more and more research going on as it relates to longevity, you're gonna see many more I think studies talking about the connection between these uh, bitter receptors, agonists uh, in our diet, and how they connect into the release of these hormones that associate themselves with longevity. So how do we establish a healthy intestinal microbiome that contributes to the production and regulation of GLP-1 and other intraendocrine hormones? The answer is you have to have the right kind of prebiotics. You have to have the right kind of a GI milieu. You have to have absence of exposure to toxins. All of those things become part of the comprehensive approach towards managing your hormones that then regulate naturally your body weight, your appetite, your metabolism. And lastly, of course, how does a Mediterranean or Mediterranean diet improve the regulation of the endocrine, uh, intraendocrine hormones? I think you know the answer to that. We've gone through it at some length now. Weed information. Culturally, we've learned from certain cultures that they're associated with longer life, lower chronic disease, lower obesity. Those are happen to be diets and lifestyles that are associated with the proper regulation of intraendocrine hormones. And now we know there are classes of nutrients that are specifically capable of signaling those processes naturally that should be part of what Dr. Musafarian talked about in my initial article that I shared with you in JAMA of this graded approach away from the GLP-1 agonist drugs into a lifestyle management utilizing the diet and nutrients that are now found to create the right kind of signals for the right kind of harmonization of our intraendocrine hormones. So in close, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. I hope this gave you some interesting and useful um, takeaway information. I can tell you for me, without question, having been in this field for five decades, this is one of those aha, just moments of great um, excitement and opportunity. We at Big Bold Health are doing all we can to try to continue to know more and how to uh, translate this into consumers and make it available and, and really have it stand up so people can employ these concepts simply in their daily lives. But we're on the threshold of moving away from drug dependency for weight loss into how we construct healthy lifestyles 
in ways that will really lead to long-term positive health outcomes, improved immune function, resilience, and long lives and healthy lives. Thanks so much on behalf of Dubold Health. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you. Be well.